we were so, talking uh, about the we were supposed to uh, play after each speaker and uh, we uh, was in behind the curtain and so Preacher Murphy he got up and he uh, made his talk you know so we decided we'll give him a good <laughs> tune we started playing old Molly Harris just uh, tearing into it you know and Miss Alta was the teacher Miss Alta Perkins yeah she come running back and pull the curtain back not now boys not now not this time <laughs> <laughs> after after you tried to give yeah. him such a good send off huh? <laughs> we stopped <laughs> that so was the first my first appearance out anywhere to play was you that know, your first appearance uh-huh and his too but we could play right along together we'd bring our instruments to school and and play a few tunes now and then you know mm -hmm. but we they, the teacher would allow us to play some then we had to to get shut on we had to put them away you know and that kept you interested in school uh -huh. i guess don't it you did. Uh -huh. so you you were making uh violins and so forth when you were in high school well along the way weren't you yeah uh-huh yeah i made some some right goodness during the high school days and so on but my first and i don't know whether i ever told you about it or not it was a tiny little crude thing. Uh, we'd had a field of corn up here on the bluff. I lived on the head of Pelton Creek then, and uh, I was just getting big enough to drop beans and this and that and the other, and mine my little brother, you know, finally. And I was about nine years old, I guess. Come up this terrible thunderstorm, run us in on the man's porch, Carpet stamper up there that lived on the bluff there then. Corbett. Uh-huh. He had a, an old fiddle. And now I'd never had my hands on one of them. I'd never been, I'd only seen one before that, and I was just very small when I seen it. And I didn't know what to think of it, you know. It made a lot of noise. I did mm -hmm. remember that. So Carbett went and got his fiddle and brought it back out onto the porch and he sat down and started playing. And by that time I had heard people sing and I knew what a tune was uh -huh. and uh, could do a little singing myself and I'd hear the harmonica played and so on. But I thought that fiddle was the finest thing that I had ever heard in my life. It just about run me wild, him playing tunes on that. And it was the prettiest thing that I had ever seen. And I began to wonder how in the world I could ever have one of them, you know. And I kept thinking about that and thinking about it, and it just kept eating on me all the time. And one night I dreamed that I had taken a piece of soft wood and it cut out the profile all around here and had nailed a top and a back on it and made a fiddle out of it next morning I was sure that was the way they was made so I jumped up before breakfast I got out of hunting material to make that thing out of and I didn't have tools there was nothing you know and I took a no big nail about a 40 penny nail and we had an old claw hammer and a piece of a railroad rail and I beat that nail till I got it sharp on the end made a chisel out of it and I had a pocket knife and I chiseled away that wood <coughs> and cut that rim out to go around and make the rim part of it, the sides of it. And then I found all the tacks that I could get a hold of and little nails and so on, pins, and I carefully pinned it on there, the top and the back that I had cut out. Then uh, there's a fellow plowing in the field pretty close by he told me he'd give me a quarter if I'd go to a white top and get him a couple of cans of Prince Albert. He had 50 cents. So he says, I'll give you the other quarter. You can buy two cans of tobacco for a quarter. And I went and got them, and I bought me a set of fiddle strings with Bought them off of Bruce Kilby that had the store out in the white top then. I put them on my fiddle, and it'd pick out. You could just pick over the strings, you know, but I didn't know nothing about tuning it or anything. Then the bow was the next problem. 
So I went and down in the swamp and cut me elder bush off. And uh, I had to burn the holes through here to put my pegs in. Uh -huh. No no bits nor drills nor nothing, you know. And I had to burn the holes through the two ends that I made for my bow that stick into the holler elder stick. And the mail carrier had an old white horse open in the field. <laughs> so I got my brother to go with me over there and we hemmed that old horse up in the fence car. <laughs> and I got him to take two corn stalks and keep that horse in there till I could crawl around through the grass and reach through the fence <laughs> and wrap enough of his tail around my fingers to make a, a fiddle bow. And when I yelled at him, he nearly drug me through the fence crack. <laughs> <laughs> about pulled my arm off, but I hung on to that hair and made me a fiddle bow out of it. And when I pulled it off the strings, I had the office disappointment. It wouldn't make a sound. Didn't sound like that other one. Nothing, no sound at all. So uh, the, this fellow, uh, old man Eller, boy, Jim Eller, come by, and his daddy was a fiddler, and he said, well, I know what, I believe that little thing would play if you had, uh, some rosin to go on your bow. He said, I'll just go home and get you some of it. Boy, it just had nothing to do but just stroll in, uh -huh. you know. So he went home and he could begin to play just a wee bit. And he brought back a right smart sized little chunk of rosin and rubbed that bow with it for a good long while and laid down in the, tuned the fiddle and laid down and put his head on the chop block where we chopped our wood and he played these tunes and it seemed to me like he'd never get through with that till I could try it. So <laughs> I set it out though, and when he gave it to me, I run to the house with it and got in behind the cook stove. And scared the cats about to death. But <laughs> I learned to play the two tunes that he played before I come out from behind that stove. Yes, I was determined to learn how to play that fiddle. <laughs> and I kept it and played on it and carried it over the country for about everywhere I went. I just about slept with it. That was my first fiddle. Now, how old were you then? I was uh, 10 years old. What about that? And I've, I've made them ever since. Just but I bet you've never cherished one any greater hard that than was that. that. I'd give anything to have that now, you know. Mm -hmm. If I could just have that now to see it. I thought about trying to reproduce it, but I couldn't do it to make it look like that, you know. Because That's too bad. it was out of symmetry and Naturally, I didn't know anything about shape and stuff, you know, and nothing but that knife to work with and a little boy besides, but I give it all I had and it worked and that was the main thing. And that was, that was uh, I guess, one of the greatest things that ever happened to me because it made me as stubborn as a mule. I never would give up nothing. Whatever I set out to do, I accomplished. I never did back down on nothing. Could be done if you decide. If you, if a person is so determined to do a thing and sets his head to do it and will study about it, he can do it. That makes, uh, that's one thing I, I like to think about mountain people as being so uh, independent. They are that. You just can't hook them up wrong. They can do anything for you. Mm -hmm. Do anything you want. Well, our mountain people that come in here, they had to do, didn't well, they? Well, yeah. And they, they had to I do. was right along with them, whatever I had. I had to get it myself. I had to make it. Or I had to fight. And you'd get around it and you'd manage. So they're still that way a whole lot. Cut your hair, build your house, make your fiddle. No one ever went to the to the barber shop, did they? No. <laughs> they cut cut the children's hair, march you out and set you down and put something around your neck and I can always remember how that hair stuck when it got down your neck. <laughs> so, can you remember that, Basil? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Once it didn't, didn't cut off the pull down. Yeah. <laughs> It looked like cornrows around the side of your head. They wasn't too good or barbers, but they got your hair off anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, how about uh, 
I, I don't want to detract from your music because we'll get back to that, but you mentioned something that's, that's interesting to me. Uh, how about doctoring and that sort of thing? Was, did your mother do most of yeah, her doctoring? Yeah, a lot of it. Uh, you come in with the croup, and uh, they had a remedy for that that I declare was I guess one croup. of the most fantastic remedies or, or laryngitis, you know. Mm -hmm. That was croup back then. Yeah. They would uh, render the fat from a skunk. Now that was the fat on on the the skunk's body. Out, outer body, you know, and uh, that was it, they made an oil out of that, a kind of a thick oil. Uh, they would put some of that in a spoon and put a little speck of sugar in on top of it. <laughs> and if they didn't want to give you the sugar, they'd put a knee in the pit of your stomach and hold your hair, and <laughs> when you opened your mouth to squall right big, they put that down your throat. That oh. was, uh, and two, they, they had the... Uh, yeah, uh-huh. And they had this, uh, what's known as Jerusalem moak seeds, you know. That was uh, worm seed, as they called it, uh -huh. and uh, that was one of the of the big problems with children back then. You could buy that worm medicine from the store, and uh, or you could make it from the worm seed and molasses. You know, that you had to go through that ordeal every once in a while, and they had bone set tea, which. If anybody had been much sick and they'd have poured a pint of that down them, they'd have died anyhow, so mm -hmm. they got well. <laughs> and balsam out of the balsam mountain to doctor with, you know, that was good for everything. As the balsam was? Uh huh. The How blister, did they do that? blisters, they would take a cup, sharp, make a sharp lip on it, and punch it into these blisters, and it'd pop that resin, that rosin out of there mm -hmm. into the cup and then pour it into a bottle and you could get about a pint or a quart in the you day. You mean in the, know. off the balsam pine? Uh-huh, yeah. And it was a real good medicine. It was, it was awful, awful good medicine. Well, did they use that for the colds too or chest cold or what? Yeah, if it was one that lingered on, you know. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. And then they, uh, they wore a little bag of asafetity around their neck to ward off diseases, you know. Mm -hmm. And they would set up peeled onions in the house during a typhoid epidemic. And they, they was one or two broke out but didn't get into epidemic stages when I was just a lad. You, know. you mean that the, they'd peel the onion, did they cook them or No, just they just uh, set they it up there. The they thought that onion would draw the germs the into store. it, you know. And uh -huh. the onion turned as black as it could be in a little while, you know. Is that right? Uh -huh. Well, does it do that if there's no typhoid germs? I don't know. Or I've often wondered about that. And two, they doctored with that onion, too. They would make a poultice out of it for a bad chest cold, you know, and, and put it on the chest of the child that had that and let him wear it overnight. <coughs> and turpentine and, and lard, that is another thing they rubbed them with where they was choking to death, you know, and, and couldn't sleep for coughing and they just have a good peaceful night's sleep. With the turpentine uh -huh. and the law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All kinds of well, it must have been on the superstitions of one kind and another too, you know. Mm -hmm. I wonder, did you ever hear of anybody accidentally poisoning anyone who in, in taking the herb man? They pretty well knew what they were doing. Yeah, uh -huh. they did know. They had uh, a lot of them had, uh, had uh, would get this Bloom's Almanac or, or or another almanac, and I can't remember the name of it, and it had all of these home remedies in it, you know. Mm -hmm. And dogs, they didn't work out just all right. Mm -hmm. They had remedies for everything. Indian doctor book, you know. Mm -hmm. High blood pressure for anything. They could, they could treat it with the herbs, you know. Mm -hmm. And just a lot of them are are used this day and age. This coat's foot as we know it, you know, wow. a coat's foot in the in the woods. Uh -huh. I believe that's what they call digitalis. Make that out of for heart patients, you know. I thought it was made out of foxglove. 
It could be. Fox it could one or the house. other. Coke foot was used in, in New Bercy was used for... Now what was that? New Bercy they called it. I don't know how it was spelled. It was called, uh, uh, was good for kidney trouble. And they had all of these things. And they worked pretty good because a lot of them people lived up around a hundred years. Mm -hmm. Just tough as mules up at 80 years old, able to do a good hard day's work and so on. Well, it, it, you know, it's too bad that we don't really know what they were doing and, and uh, all that, isn't it? It is. We, we probably could I believe that, uh, benefit by it. We could. One thing, they were active, you know. They mm -hmm. didn't sit down or they didn't, when they had to go somewhere, if they didn't have a horse to ride, they lit out and walked from here to Independence. I've done that many of the time. How many miles is that? That would be, I guess, about 30 miles or something or another. You'd walk it? Yeah. How long did it take you to walk it? Well, you, you could get down there in the run of a day, you know. Mm -hmm. A little tired, maybe. Not so bad. It you wouldn't tire you like it. It seemed like it would. You rest a few minutes and you was all right. <laughs> well, now, where was the pine hole? Do you know where that yeah. was? And uh, you know, why was it called pine hole? Because uh, of uh, the nature of the terrain there, it was more or less swampy. Mm -hmm. And uh, these huge spruce and hemlock, uh, that's where they cut all of them out from. And it lays right back across uh, from where the Massey Gap is, if you've been on the Grayson Highlands Park up here. Mm -hmm. Right on back across through there was the pine holes. That's in, in the Pine Mountain, you know, and, and back in that. Did they have big, uh, big uh, logging operations going on? Yeah. Uh-huh. I can remember that on the head of Helton Creek, that was virgin timber up there. And they cut out these huge hemlocks. They would have, one of them fall, they'd reach from here to the road down there. Hmm. Way tired, away above the other hardwood timber, you know, a third higher than any of the rest of them. And some of them would be so big that uh, it is difficult to find a saw, that a cross-cut saw that would reach through them. You'd only have about Maybe six inches on the side. You remember them, don't you, Basil? Yes, sir. That and they cut these huge trees down that was hundreds of years old, maybe a thousand years old, you know. And they'd come crashing down and break down small timber. Just oh, they just you know when they started cutting the timber out, they didn't spare anything. They just mm -hmm. broke it up. They didn't cut it in a way to. Uh, be conservative and they almost got everything that was worth anything for timber was cut out but I can remember a water oak tree that was skidded down the side of the bluff mountain up yonder and they had to split that tree before the log before they could skid it that they had to drive wedges in it and split it it was so big uh, they was heavy and I don't guess there was a team of horses, and they had some huge horses in there. Biggest feet I've ever seen, big perching horses. They could pull a tremendous load, but they couldn't pull a log off of that till they split it, you know. Hmm. That water oak is heavy anyhow. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a lot of our good timbers, I guess. As you say, they, they wasn't thinking of con conservation. No, they figured they? they'd have a everlasting supply mm -hmm. of it, but you can destroy anything after a while. Was it dark in the, in that, is that, uh, with that area, the pile, the pine trees, was that? Uh, you go into the woods and it was, it was dark. You go in under these pines and, and it was, it was dark and gloomy in there and very lonely. That's why they called it, I guess, the pine hole. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you were talking too about the, this covered wagon that uh, uh -huh. we were. You yeah, that uh, wagon, I don't remember. We was going, my mother's brother lived, my uncle lived out at White Top there, and she wanted to go see him, and somebody had this covered wagon that was going there to haul something or something or another, and so we 
they stopped and we all loaded up into the covered wagon and took off for White Top. And that was uh, that was their mode of transportation, really, up that until was, after uh, World yeah. War Two, wasn't it? And the first uh, cars, first car that I ever remember coming up this road here, I would have been. Oh, I guess two years old or something, and it sounded like, oh, it made the awfulest noise you ever hear. And come roaring up over the, up the road, and the road then, this road wasn't built around here. It had to go up the other side of the hill over here. Mm -hmm. And it looked like it had turned over in dead level, and it looked to me like it was a terrible high thing, you know. <laughs> I just <laughs> hid that way. And they pulled me out of the bed to show me the first airplane that ever flew through here. Hmm. But I never could get awake enough to see it. Uh -huh. Have no remembrance of ever seeing it. And the next airplane, we lived on the head of Helton Creek when the airplane flew over, you know, a little tiny airplane uh -huh. sometimes roaring around up there. But uh, from the covered wagon and the team of horses or mules or oxen, I don't know which that pulled it. Oxen pulled them a lot, you know. That would have been about uh, 19, 18, or 19. I, I, I've got a memory that goes almost back to babyhood. Mm -hmm. From that time on up till now, there's been more progress made in transportation then all the way back to the dawn of civilization, as far as yes, I know. Yes, I would imagine. Back to the month from from the ox cart and <laughs> to the moon. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, when you when uh, now up until after World War Two, there weren't very many no. cars in this area. No. Well, really, there weren't that many roads. No, were they? no roads. At Not to. You get roads, over to mountains. None of them was paved hardly through the mountains. Sure, you know. Mm -hmm till after the Second World War. I guess uh, there wasn't any money for the boys no, to buy cars. No, and, and that's A car, though, a car was high back then, because I can remember a fella coming to where a man was applying for my daddy and selling him a uh, 19 and 29 Chevrolet car, touring car, for five hundred and fifty-five dollars. That was the price of a new car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about your uh, music. What you, let's talk about what you're doing now with your music. Now you are teaching through Wilkes Community College up at West uh, uh -huh. Jefferson, aren't you? And up here Arthur. at uh, the fire department. In and that's sponsored by the fire department in, in uh, White Top. Oh, so, really? Uh huh. We have uh, one night up there, have two nights for the Wilkes Community College, Tuesday and Thursday night. Uh, be about four hours each, uh, each night up there, and about two hours up here, one night a week. How many students have you got up at? What's Jer uh, Jefferson? Now, I don't know how many there is in all the classes, but I would have anywhere from uh, uh, 10 to 20 each time, you know. Mm -hmm. It's been going since midsummer of last year. And you have a, a violin and banjo and guitar. Uh huh. Now, uh, uh, we mentioned, I don't think we've talked about. Uh, the fiddlers conventions that you've been in and won. Uh, do you have a record or do you know how many ribbons over there you have well, for first place? A lady was uh, here a while back and she said that I had 53 ribbons there and they some trophies and this that and the other and there's a whole lot of them that I used to play in that didn't give you a ribbon you know mm -hmm. so I never tried to keep no count of them or anything I just go to everyone I could get to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So uh, several of them I won that I didn't. I just got money, you know, no, no ribbon or nothing so far. And mm -hmm. then I lost a good many of them too. So I've been to several fiddler conventions. <laughs> 
You've always worked in machine shops or... I was, I guess, that I would have called my occupation a machinist. And uh, then I worked for Brunswick uh, in the machine shop there. So if I had any one thing that I would have called the occupation, it would have been that. Uh -huh. They hired me as a model maker, Brunswick did there. I made the first of of everything that was used to, uh, like bombs and rockets, make the hardware for them, and machine guns, I made some machine guns. Oh, at bronze. Uh-huh. Done repair work on the 25 millimeter rifles that was there. Just anything they needed, I made it for them, you know. And anything you want to, you can make too, can't well, you? Well, I've not failed yet. I may find something I can't make someday. <laughs> I don't believe you will. <laughs> He's not much of an electrician. Are you? No, I can put batteries in the flashlight, and if I don't get uh -huh. them turned wrong, they'll burn. But that's all I know about electricity. <laughs> uh, uh, well, that's uh, it's fantastic. It really is. Now, I want to ask you, I know you've been making musical instruments for a long, long time, and you've been selling them. Who sold them? Have you sold them to any um, uh, professional people that we see on television? Harold Hensley plays one of my fiddles. Oh, yeah. I've the Hollywood him. Harold. And uh, the girls got to see him er, in the movie the other day, playing a fiddle that was made a whole lot like this and with the... Uh, Bind, pearl binding around it and so on. Uh -huh. And I made one for, I made them for several radio people. I never thought much about it, but. Uh, he, he plays on chips and. Yeah. Stand by your man. And uh huh. Several uh -huh. And I think I saw. Several, th several things that he plays on. There, he's uh, the biggest celebrity, I guess. The rest have been. Radio and television people, and just general. She knows it's from White Top. Uh huh. Now, Harold is originally from White Top. But it meant more to you getting one yeah. in his uh -huh. hand, really, than yeah. it than anyone uh -huh. else, wouldn't it? Yeah. His father had asked him to make him one years and years and years ago, hadn't he? Yeah. But he never got it made. Right. Have you ever been down to Nashville? I never did go to Nashville. I used to like the music there. Uh, when they had the Grand Ole Opry with so much string mountain music, you know, mm -hmm, it used to be mm -hmm. real good. But country music has changed its uh, pace kindly. They have a different uh, kind of music there from what they used to have, you know. What? We no longer have a fiddling Arthur Smith and the Possum Hunters, and, or the Coon Hunters and the uh, Gully Jumpers and all of this. They all sing these heart songs mainly, you know, uh -huh. and and that's just not very good for fiddle tunes. Uh -huh. I still hold the old traditional mountain fiddle tunes. That's my kind of music. Well, you play other instruments besides a fiddle, too, don't you? I've played the mandolin some and uh, played guitar, but I quit all of it but the fiddle years ago. Now, you've been making, what instruments do you make? You make the dog, you I've used to made, make I've uh, made auto harp, mandolin, fiddle, guitars, banjos. And dulcimers, and uh, I had one that was that I invented, and I it was a a very versatile instrument. It could be played several different ways, and I give it to uh, one of my friends that was going out to tour the whole country, you know, to take along and play. And uh, I never did uh, try to put it on any market or anything. I'm just doing it for the fun of it, you know. And uh, your daughter, uh, you, uh, she uh, makes the dulcimers. I believe you said and could make instruments yeah, too. Uh, do you all take orders, or, or I know you're right, pretty we well will. known everywhere. Uh -huh. We'll take orders. Lots of times they come and uh, or write me, you know, or they've seen a fiddle uh, that I'd made and tell me they'd like to have one of them and. I get a lot of that kind of letters. So we never have spent any money at all or anything in advertising. We can't, I've brought